for those of y'all who missed part one last week, the name of this sermon series is The Power of the Mind. Somebody say, The Power of the Mind. The Power of the Mind. You can catch last week's message on House of Prayer's YouTube or Facebook pages if you missed it. No worries. I highly encourage you to go back and watch it simply because it gives a lot of context and builds a foundation for some of the things that we'll be talking about today. Amen. All right. So to recap, last week we learned that our minds have significant power to either positively or negatively impact our lives. And we learned that research shows our brains think up to 60 thousand thoughts per day. It also shows that most of our thoughts are repetitive and negative. There are recent studies that show our minds are actually able to determine our actions before we even consciously think to do something. It's no surprise that many of us for this reason are caught in negative, repetitive habits and behaviors. So the Bible teaches us that our thoughts can defile us and lead us astray. And this is because the sin of Adam and Eve corrupted our minds. But through his sacrifice, Jesus offers us freedom from the power of sin. We also learned last week that the Holy Spirit can empower us to overcome our sinful nature and our thoughts. And also to bring the spiritual reality of our salvation into our daily lives. We learned that regularly, say regularly, regularly regularly reading the word of God by the power of the Spirit, can renew and transform our minds. And that consistent daily habits can lead to significant growth over time. Amen? Amen. This week, we're going to learn the kinds of the thoughts that need to be replaced, and we're going to learn what we need to aim for. We're going to expose the enemy's strategy to influence our thoughts, our beliefs, our actions, and our lives. And we're going to learn how to renew our minds by the power of the Spirit. Amen? Amen? Yeah. Awesome. So turn with me to Colossians chapter 3. We're going to start in verse 1. That's Colossians chapter 3. This is in the New Testament, so if you're flipping forward, it's towards the end of the Bible. And I'm reading from the New Living Translation. That's Colossians chapter 3. So you got it when you're there. Got it. Y'all are quick. Awesome. So for some context, in this passage, Paul is speaking to the church at Colossae. And a fun fact is he'd actually never been to this city. He was writing to a people that he hoped and desired to have a relationship with. He wanted to teach and serve them. So from afar, he was building a relationship with them through this letter. And it's thought that this is written while Paul was still imprisoned in Rome. The purpose of this letter is to address and tear down false teachings that were spreading through their church. These teachings lessened the role of Jesus and they challenged believers' identities. In this letter, Paul also encourages the believers to grow in their spiritual maturity. So start with me in verse 1, where it says, Since we have been raised to new life with Christ, hallelujah, set your sights on the realities of heaven, where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. For you died to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all his glory. So put to death the sinful, earthly things lurking within you. Have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, and evil desires. Don't be greedy, for a greedy person is an idolater, worshiping the things of this world. Because of these sins, the anger of God is coming. You used to do these things when your life was still a part of this world, but now is the time to get rid of anger, rage, malicious behavior, slander, and dirty language. Don't lie to each each other, for you have stripped off your old sinful nature and all its wicked deeds. Put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. In this new life, it doesn't matter if you're Jew or a Gentile, uncircumcised or circumcised, barbaric, uncivilized, slave or free. Christ is all that matters, and he lives in all of us. Verse 12, since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourselves with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. 
Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. And let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as members of one body, you are called to live in peace and always be thankful. Let the message about Christ and all its richness fill your lives. Teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom he gives. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. And whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. The word of the Lord. Amen. So, in this passage, Paul is urging the Colossian church to continually set their minds on the things of God, and also to put to death the sinful desires of their flesh. We learned last week in Romans chapter 8 that the way to overcome our sinful nature is by allowing the Holy Spirit to renew our minds. But what I love about this passage in Colossians in particular is that Paul illustrates what it looks like to be renewed by the Lord. He says to have tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, he says to forgive anyone who offends you. He says to clothe yourselves in love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. He says to live in peace and to always be thankful. Paul's giving us a standard to aim for. Somebody say, a standard. A standard. A standard that we need in a fallen world that is leading us to think, act, believe, do, and be anything but like Jesus. Right, right. How many of you are living all of these things? or can say that you honestly meet the standard completely. I see no hands, mine included, is down. This means that we need to renew our minds. To live the way that Paul describes, we need to renew our minds. We have to come out of alignment with the thoughts and the beliefs that don't align with the word of God, that don't align with the truth, don't, don't align with the character and nature of Christ that we are called to emulate. And just as the Colossian church was facing lies and false doctrines, we're faced daily with lies, specifically from the enemy, that are meant to steer us away from God and away from the truth. If accepted and if internalized, these lies create what are called ungodly beliefs. Ungodly beliefs. So if you're a note taker, we'll define an ungodly belief as a belief that is contrary to the word of God. That is a belief that is contrary to the word of God. Our experiences are causing us to form beliefs about ourselves, about others, and about God. Remember last week how we learned that the sin of Adam and Eve led, or led to our minds being corrupted and then out of alignment with God? Yes. I remember it's because <laughs> God. Because we live in a fallen world, many of the beliefs that we create are not in alignment with the Word. They're not. If kids only wanted to hang out with you at lunch because your mom packed the good cookies, you might think that your value only comes from what you can offer others. Or maybe that giving others what they want is the key to getting them to love you. Or maybe that God only wants you for what you can give him. If your parents rejected you or if they didn't want to spend time with you growing up, you might believe you're unlovable. You might believe that God doesn't love you or doesn't want to spend time with you. If you struggle to understand math in school when everybody else around you just seem to get it, you might think you're stupid or that you can't learn new things or that maybe God just made a mistake with you. If your body was always a little bit bigger than everybody else around you growing up, you might think you're unattractive or that to be loved you need to compensate for your looks by being funny or smart or successful or maybe that God was unfair in creating you the way that he did. These ungodly beliefs influence not just our thoughts, but also our actions. Remember last week how we discussed that most people's thoughts are both repetitive and negative? Mm -hmm. These thoughts are stemming from our ungodly beliefs. Mm -hmm. And remember how our brains can predetermine our actions before we even consciously decide to choose to do anything? Ungodly beliefs cause your brain to form expectations mm -hmm. that influence your actions expectations. If you believe that you're unattractive or unlovable, you may subconsciously expect already that no one want to be with you. 
And this would cause you to treat them already like they don't like you. If you believe that your value comes from what you can do or what you can do for God or for others, this might cause you to think, I have to say yes to everyone, no matter what they ask for. And this would cause you to be overextended, to do more than you can handle, and to neglect your own needs. If you believe God doesn't see, love, or care for you, you're not going to expect him to show up for you. You're not going to expect him to have a meaningful, powerful plan for your life. And this would lead you to think that the way that you live and what you do does not matter. Beliefs are the secret drivers behind all of our behaviors. And if you want to live the life of love and peace that Paul describes in his letter to the Colossians, you have to deal with your ungodly beliefs. You have to. Because the fruit of ungodly beliefs is exactly what he describes. It's anger, rage, malicious behavior, slander, dirty language, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, and evil desires. It's dishonesty, it's greed, it's worshiping the things of this world. Who can identify with one or more of these? Right? Every one of us. Most of the hands were just raised. Online, if you were wondering, almost all of their hands were raised. <laughs> this is the fruit of an ungodly belief. And you have to deal with it. Don't pass up the freedom that Jesus paid for. It is here, it is yours, and you can have it today. Because left undealt with, our ungodly beliefs allow the enemy to take territory in our minds and rule our lives. They become mental strongholds. For our note takers, a mental stronghold is any area where the enemy has a strongly defended, deeply rooted, fortified rule over your mind and your life. A mental stronghold is any area where the enemy has a strongly defended, deeply rooted, fortified rule over your mind and your life. The enemy's ultimate goal is to separate us from God and dominate our lives. And he knows the mind is incredibly powerful. So he'll come at people's thoughts again and again and again until they decide to believe him, giving him authority in that area. Then he'll reinforce a person's ungodly beliefs over and over through harmful experiences and through repetitive, untruthful thoughts. This is how the stronghold is built. And once the enemy has gained authority in someone's mind, he then uses it to negatively influence their beliefs, their thoughts, their actions, and their lives. A mental stronghold that's not addressed will spread like cancer into every area of your life. And many spirit-filled Christians are walking around, oppressed by the enemy, allowing him to influence and burden their minds. What does this look like? It's when someone has so believed a lie that they're imprisoned by it. It's when a lie dictates their thoughts, their emotions, and their actions. It's when no matter how much they desire to break free from it, they feel like they can't. This happens to all of us at some point in time. Has it happened to any of you? Yes. Yeah? Is there an area of your life that feels uncontrollable? Or do you feel burdened or weighed down by your thoughts? Do you find yourself falling into the same patterns again and again, unable to stop or break free? Do you find yourself drawn by lust to watch or do things that you know in your spirit you shouldn't be doing or watching? Or do you find yourself unable to stop eating even though your body is full? Or playing situations over and over and over in your head and just thinking about how someone hurt or offended you and then avoiding them when you see them? Remember, your actions are telling all. What's stemming, it's, it's stemming from what you believe. Your actions are stemming from your beliefs. Yes. Can I be transparent with y'all for a moment? Yes. Great. I'm going to tell you a story. So. The enemy has worked really hard to make me think that I have no value. Because if I don't believe in myself, I won't fight for myself. Mm -hmm. I'll let my life drift away. I'll let people walk all over me. I'll make myself smaller and smaller and smaller to just try to disappear. To try to make room for what I imagine to have so much more value than me, everybody else. 
Since I've made enough terrible decisions and I've measured my worth most of my life by my actions, it's really easy to think that my failure is an indicator that I have nothing to offer, that I'm worthless. And when people reinforce that by treating me as worthless and in their pride, making me small and using me as their pedestal, that belief became law in my mind. I stopped dreaming, I lost hope, I didn't defend myself, I gave up. Because I felt that I had no right to a great life if I had no value. I think success is for winners, joy is for them, love is for them, but these things can't be for me because I'm, I'm nothing, not me. And if I'm honest with myself, after all of these years, after renewing my mind, after walking in faith, watching the Lord perform miracles in my life and in other people's lives, after overcoming storm after storm, climbing mountains and going through valleys, just to survive and push forward in this fallen world, if I'm honest, I still, I still struggle to believe that I'm worth something. Mm -hmm. And it has been the fight of my life. There have been many things that God has called me to that I just believed I wasn't qualified for because I thought I had nothing to offer. When he called me to serve in the leadership team, I was convinced that I was the weakest, worst, least qualified one of the leaders, that I had to step back and let everybody else lead first, that I shouldn't try to speak or move in the spirit because I wasn't good enough, that I had nothing to offer the body of Christ. I sincerely believed this. I thought, okay, Really, why, why me, God? You're, you're choosing me? Is, is it because there's nobody else available to do this job? I'm obviously your last choice, right? Like, <laughs> it was easy to accept the word of God as truth when it says, we all sin and fall short of the glory of God. I would think, yep, yeah, I sure do. Here I am, a failure. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus, for choosing me anyway. But what about when it says I'm God's treasure possession? Come on. What about when it says I'm fearfully and wonderfully made? Yeah. I can pray these scriptures like the best of us, and I can believe it for other people. But for myself, no, I didn't believe it at all. I would pray and I would contend, but deep down, I still felt worthless. We were in a prayer team meeting a couple weeks ago, and the pastors were encouraging us to pray with courage and with boldness and with confidence. And I was so conflicted. I was like, how can I pray with confidence and with boldness? I have nothing to offer. So I asked, is it okay if I'm like so aware of my own imperfections and failures that I'm not relying on myself at all, but I'm relying on God like this, like this tiny T holding up a giant golf ball? And Miss Kathy, in all her wisdom, said, it's okay if you see yourself as this small that big but what's not okay is if you see yourself as this small and everybody else is that big mm -hmm. it My was God. like a kick yeah. to the gods does wow. anyone else relate to what i'm wow. saying right now yes is this for anybody else yeah. i'm not the only one who's felt this way no. Amen. so i thanked miss kathy and i joked about her being such a counselor <laughs> and then i <laughs> fell in tears for the rest of the meeting but the Lord was speaking to me, and I wasn't ready to hear him. Do you believe you're valuable? Do you see your own worth? Do you believe that I created you to be worth something? It's really easy to pour yourself out in service, professionally or in ministry, for other people, when you think that everybody else is more deserving than you. But that's not God-honoring. That's not God-honoring at all. Because it's in direct opposition to what he says about us. He can't create something invaluable. He can't be Amen. good and loving and perfect and make mistakes. Amen. He can't. Amen. So why is it that after knowing the truth, after knowing the word of God, after hearing it year after year, after believing it for other people, that I couldn't seem to get this for myself? It's because the enemy succeeded in convincing me to believe the lie that I am worth less than everyone else. So much so that the ungodly belief became a stronghold. It became a prison in my mind that subconsciously impacted every decision, every interaction. I deflect compliments, I change the subject, 
I dreaded being really seen. And I don't know about y'all, but I don't want my mortal enemy having control over me. Come on, man. It's crazy how I let the devil, who literally hates me, lead me in so many areas of my life. Just as God had freed me before from so many other ungodly beliefs, he was calling me to war again for the freedom that he promises us. So in small group, this past Wednesday, somebody say, this past Wednesday, this past Wednesday, Wednesday. the Lord spoke to me through his word. We were reading in Romans chapter 8, where it says in verse 3, the law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. So God did what the law could not do. He sent his own son in a body like the bodies we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. And what stuck out to me was the word giving his son. The generosity and the sweetness of God is on display there. And the fact that he gave us something of such great value. Such great value that it was given as a sacrifice. And then it hit me. You don't give something of value. You don't sacrifice something for something that has no value. You sacrifice something you treasure to gain something incredibly valuable. Through sacrificing his son, God demonstrated how valuable we are to him. How valuable I am to him. I am valuable to God. The creator of the universe thinks that I am extremely valuable, a treasured possession worth dying for. It took the Holy Spirit revealing the heart of God through his word to blow a hole through the stronghold in my mind, for him to be able to see the light pouring through my prison walls and to hear him saying, do you want the freedom that I paid for? Do you want the freedom that he paid for? Oh, yes. Or are you content to remain under the leadership of the devil? It's your choice. And you should be content. Please stand with me. The word of God brought to life by the power of the Holy Spirit is the key to overcoming our ungodly beliefs and our mental strongholds. It is the only way. It is the only way. To have freedom in your mind, you have to learn the truth. You have to learn the truth about God. Who is he? What is his character like? What does he desire? We see in Psalm 145, it says, The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. You have to learn the truth about yourself. What does God say about you? Who are you created to be? The word says we're new creations in Christ a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. His workmanship created in Christ for good works, which God prepared beforehand. It says we're children of God. So what better way is there to learn about yourself than to ask the one who created you? Stop letting the devil and everybody else tell you who you are. Let the one who created you tell you who you are. You need to have an honest self-evaluation you need to be truthful about where you are right now. What do you believe about yourself? What do you believe about others? What do you believe about God? What are your actions saying about your thoughts? What's holding you back to all that God has called you to? Assess your thoughts and your actions. See what is out of alignment with the truth. What doesn't align with who God is and what he says about you. Ask the Holy Spirit to show you right now. Every eye closed in this place. Every eye closed. Online for you too. Ask the Holy Spirit to reveal your destructive beliefs. Open your mouth. Ask him to point out the repetitive, uncontrollable thoughts that are leading you into sin. Let him show you. Open your mouth. Begin to talk to the Lord. And online, wherever you are right now, begin to engage the Lord. Ask him What is it? What do I believe? What mental strongholds have me caught in a lie, Lord? If 
You're settling for less than the freedom that Jesus paid for on the cross. Do not settle. We're here to uproot ungodly beliefs. We're here to tear down mental strongholds that are ruling your life. We're going to call you up in a minute to lay hands, but I don't want you to miss what the Lord is doing right now. God is speaking to people right now about ungodly beliefs and mental strongholds. He's revealing areas of oppression that he wants to liberate you from. Do not miss it. Press in for two more minutes, y'all. this freedom in your mind, 
and walk with him for all of eternity by his power, by his love, and by his grace. This is your chance to start over. And it really does not matter how far gone you think you are <laughs> or what you've done, really, honestly, because Jesus died for us while we were sinners. And he desires to have a relationship with you. He desires to set you free. If that's you, please raise your hand. And if that's you online, write salvation in the chat. And if you need prayer for your mind, if you're struggling with an ungodly belief, or the Lord is revealing something to you that you just what you need to address, do not leave this place bound. If there's a mental stronghold that is ruling your life, maybe you're struggling to believe that you're valuable like I did. Whatever it is that you are battling with in your mind, God wants to set you free, and we want to pray with you. Raise your hand if that's you. I see the hands. Online, if that's you, write pray for my mind in the chat. We're going to pray together. Amen? Repeat after me. God, God, thank you for valuing my life. Thank you for valuing my life. Enough to die on the cross for me. Enough to die on the cross for me. Thank you, Jesus, for rising again. Thank you, Jesus, for rising again. So I can have freedom. So I can have freedom. And eternal life. And eternal life. I repent for all of my sins. I repent for all of my sins. I repent for all of my ungodly beliefs. I repent for all of my ungodly beliefs. Come into my heart and my mind. Come into my heart and my mind. Heal and restore me. Heal and restore me. You alone are my Lord and Savior. You alone are my Lord and Savior. I praise you and I thank you, God. I praise you and I thank you, God. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. We thank you, Lord, for the transformative work you're doing in your people right now. Holy Spirit, we invite you to come into this place. Fill your house, Lord. Renew our minds and set us free for your glory. We honor and we worship you, Lord. And have your way in this place in the name of Jesus. Online family. Thank you so much for dialing in. Spend some time with the Lord right now, even as we're closing out service. Invite him into those places. Get in the word this week and invite the Lord to uproot your ungodly beliefs and your mental strongholds. Partner with him to replace those lies with the truth of his word. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and give you peace. We'll see you next week.